the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dearly beloved in Christ, we're all familiar with the glories of Mary, her immaculate conception, her divine maternity, her assumption, her humility, her chastity, her power over evil. <clears throat> Demons hated her since the beginning of time. Our Lady is horrible to the demons and evil spirits. She's terrible to them and sends them back to the pit of hell. She will always crush their heads. Evil spirits and demons fear her. They hate her because she's so humble and good. She's good, holy, pure, and has every virtue. There is no selfishness in Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary had no malice. No anger, no pride. She was humble even as a child. No rash judgment of others. My dearly beloved in Christ, she's always by our Lord's side, helping him, always praying for everyone, asking for mercy for everyone. She's surrounded by angels all the time. Our Lady protects people and leads them to her son. She protects all her children. My dearly beloved in Christ, Protestants don't like her because she's honored so much in the church. Supposedly, they only want Jesus honored. Luther taught Protestants to hate Our Lady. He was influenced by a priest who had given himself to the dark side. Has any devout servant of Mary ever gone to hell? No. They can try, they can tempt us, but... The devout servant of Mary has never been lost. In the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, we see the rays which show Mary's purity, holiness, and power. And then at the bottom, you see, looks like a moon. It's black. Those are horns. She's crushing Satan's head. In the lineage of Our Lady, we call her the cause of our joy. But for demons, it's the cause of their demise and torment. Devotion to Mary helps people at the end of their lives and when they pray for their children. It obtains the grace of final perseverance. Evil spirits hate her prayers, especially the rosary and the Hail Mary. With the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary, all demons fear this prayer and her. In summary, Our Lady is the most beautiful creature in God's universe and our mother. Regarding the rosary, the mothers who pray the rosary for their children, their children have a chance, even if they've gone astray. Our Lady protects those who pray the rosary. It protects us from sinning. It's Our Lady's favorite prayer. She wants people to pray it all the time. The rosary should be prayed by families, the youth, and priests. For Satan is stealing souls every day. Many go to hell. Keep praying the rosary. It keeps people from falling into hell. If people pray the rosary, they're saved from the grips of hell. If people pray and aren't sincere and repent, Our Lady will fight for their souls at the end of their life. Each rosary that we pray goes to our judgment. It's, we receive little graces or many, many graces, depending on how many you say in a whole lifetime. When we pray the rosary, Our Lady protects us and sends graces down to help us. If we say many rosaries all through our lives, the Blessed Virgin Mary will be there at the end of our life and she will help us not to lose our soul. Demons try to prevent us from praying the rosary because it saves souls, snatches souls from hell. It converts sinners. What will happen if we neglect praying the rosary? We won't be protected. We will sin easier. The evil spirits scream when they see the rosary, even before people begin to pray it. They tremble when we begin to pray. The rosary 
makes demons feel bad. The prayers torture them. It's like fire, and like daggers. They hate those beads. The rosary attacks Satan and all the demons. It weakens them. They hate it. The rosary should be taught to even little children. When Our Lady of Fatima told Lucia that the rosary would have special efficacy in these times, she meant grace, power, and protection. The Blessed Virgin Mary said that many souls were being lost and emphasized the children especially. My dear the beloved Christ, St. Bernard asserts the demons in hell tremble when they hear the name of Mary. And that's why in time of temptation, just repeat the holy names of Jesus and Mary. Eventually they'll leave. St. Alphonsus draws this comparison. When Holofernes planned to capture the city of Bethulia, he first cut off the aqueduct by which the inhabitants received their supply of water. In like manner, the evil one first does his utmost to rob souls of their devotion to Mary. And after he has deprived them of this channel of grace, he can easily bring them under his power. He endeavors to rob both the just and sinners of their devotion to the Mother of God, or at least to weaken it. For if anyone fails to practice his devotion, he's in great danger of falling into sin. Satan knows how much the just stand in need of Mary's help in order to persevere. Devotion to Mary increases sanctity. Father Faber mentions four reasons why many do not require sanctity. One of them is lack of devotion to Mary. The evil spirits try to rob sinners of this devotion because they know that whoever loves and honors Mary will sooner or later be saved by her. And she witnessed the death of her divine son. She went through th this lifetime of sorrow knowing what would happen. And even after the crucifixion, every Friday would meditate and recall the sufferings our Lord went through. Our souls were so precious. She doesn't want to see her son's precious blood shed in vain for anyone. She wants everyone to be saved. No matter how low a sinner may have fallen, he should never give up venerating Our Lady, but should pray to her daily. Father Faber says, thousands of souls perish because Mary is withheld from them. And I'd just like to speak for a moment in closing about the devotion to the sorrows of Our Lady, and then we'll have a story. Devotion to the sorrows of the Mary is a source of great graces because it's so pleasing to our divine Lord. Many holy writers say that through her sufferings, Mary placed an obligation, as it were, upon her son, which constrains him to grant her whatever she asks of him. Our Lord once said to Veronica Benasco, My daughter, the tears you shed in compassion for my sufferings are pleasing to me, but bear in mind that on account of my excessive love for my mother, the tears you shed in compassion for her sufferings are still more precious. There are indeed few devotions for which our Lord made greater promises than this one. And there are few more pleasing to him. Through her martyrdom, Mary has become in a special way the comfortess of the afflicted. We say that in a litany, comforter of the afflicted, pray for us. It was by her own experience of sorrow that she was taught the empathy which enables her to comfort her children in all their afflictions. God gave her a mighty and empathetic heart for this great task. For all God's children, the way to heaven leads across the Mount of Calvary, the way of trial and suffering. In the company of our sorrowful mother, we walk more easily, fight more courageously, and suffer more patiently, perseveringly, and joyfully. For she holds us up and she holds before us not only the example of the sufferings and death of her divine Son, but also the victory, the joy, and the glory which he has won by his sufferings. How often do we grow impatient, 
faint-hearted, despondent, or inconstant in suffering, without endurance, without resignation, full of complaints and murmuring. Let us deeply engrave in our hearts the sorrows of Mary, for she, our sorrowful mother, ever our model in suffering, in the patient endurance of trials, and in the humble acceptance of sorrows and afflictions. When our Lord lays a heavy cross upon your shoulders, turn to our sorrowful mother, and you will obtain consolation and strength to carry the cross patiently, bravely, and meritoriously. Devotion to the sorrows of Mary should be practiced especially by souls who wish to rid themselves of sinful habits. This devotion nourishes the spirit of compunction, affords great consolation, and strengthens confidence in God's mercy, draws down special protection from Mary in the hour of temptation, and preserves a converted sinner from relapsing into sin. The graces which our Lord promised to those who are devoted to the sorrows of his blessed mother are very great. St. Alphonsus, in one of his discourses on the sorrows of Mary, states, It was revealed to St. Elizabeth that some years after the Blessed Virgin was assumed into heaven, St. John, the beloved disciple, had an ardent desire to see her again. This favor was granted him. His dear mother appeared to him in company with our divine Lord. Then St. John heard Mary asking of her son some special graces for those who were devoted to her sorrows. Our Lord promised the four following graces. First, those who invoke the Heavenly Mother through her sorrows will obtain true sorrow for their sins before death. Second, our Savior will protect them in their tribulations, especially at the hour of death. Three, he will impress upon them the memory of his passion and will reward them for it in heaven. And then fourth, he will commit such devout servants to the hands of Mary that she may dispose of them according to her pleasure and obtain for them all the graces she desires. Besides these great graces, Father Faber enumerates others which are obtained through devotion to Mary's sorrows. This devotion has a remarkable connection with great interior holiness. It reveals the emptiness of worldly joys. It gives us a permanent share in the sorrow for sin which Jesus and Mary felt. And then lastly, it communicates to our souls the spirit of the cross and gives us the strength to endure our own sufferings with resignation to the holy will of God. So I'll just close with the story. A young lady was one day returning home from the woods when she fell into the hands of a band of outlaws. They immediately showed what their intentions were. The unfortunate young lady, knowing, not knowing what else to, to do to save herself, knelt down at the feet of the leader of the band and begged him not to take away from her the only treasure she had, her purity and her honesty. She wept and asked him to free her in the name and for the love of Mary. Her pleading in the mention of the Holy Name of Mary made such an impression on the bandits that none of them dared to touch her. So they let her go and asked her to pray to the Virgin for them. That same night, the leader of the group had a dream. The Blessed Virgin visited him and thanked him for having spared the young lady. Since it was only a dream, the outlaw did not attach too much importance to this vision. But a few years later, he was caught and condemned to be hung. The night before his execution, he again saw Mary in his dream. She asked if he knew her. I think I saw you once before, he replied. Yes, you have seen me, said the virgin. I came to you to thank you for having shown respect for my name. Now I have to come. Now I've come to reward you. Tomorrow, I shall be present at your execution. I have already told the Lord that you have sincerely repented. The bandit awoke and encouraged by his vision, confessed his sins and showed sincere repentance. He walked to the gallows in a happy mood. And just before putting his neck into the loop, he asked forgiveness 
of all the people and urge them to practice a special devotion to Mary. He died with the name of the Virgin on his lips. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.